It is always a delight to gather in the Lord's name and to welcome you. So welcome most heartily. Good to be gathered together. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. We would join with David and we would say, I will bless the Lord at all times, at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So Lord, we come into your presence and we would exalt you, our mighty God, our great King. And so Lord, receive the praise that we offer and be exalted. So be lifted up, we ask. Work your will in our hearts and in this service, receive your rightful place, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join together and sing, Rise Up, O Men of God. We will use verses 1, 2, and 4. I would ask that you remain seated as we sing. Verses 1, 2, and 4. I'm reading from Psalm, both one and two, the first and the second Psalm. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge 
in him. We will now sing together verses 1 and 4 of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Psalm 37, the first 22 verses. This reading will be continued in the message of this morning. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more, and you will look carefully for his place and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword will enter their own heart, and their bows will be broken. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil, and in the days of famine they will have abundance. But the wicked will perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke, they vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not pay back. 
but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by him will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. Let us now sing the first and the last verse of God Leads Us Along. Please join with me as we again go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in you, and we are thankful that you take us by the hand and you lead us along. We are confident in your goodness. We are confident in your watchful eye that you will keep us from danger that would overwhelm us, O oh Lord. We give you thanks and praise for your continued goodness, for all of your mercy. Lord, receive from us, from grateful hearts, glad praise for your goodness and for your kindness. For this past week, we give you thanks and for all of our lives that you have been so gracious to us. We praise and we honor, we adore you. We come today and we would pray and lift needs of various kinds, some which have been raised before you countless times. We would again come and press our petition before the throne of grace. Hear us, Lord, and for those which have come upon us very quickly, we would also bring those and say, Lord, arise and show your mighty power in our midst, we ask. We pray for our Jerusalem and we pray for Dominion Street, asking that for every home, for every life there, that your grace, that your glory would shine so brightly into their hearts and that they would come to the cross and truly live. We pray for our friends and mission partners at the Union Gospel Mission praying that for all of the leadership, the staff, the volunteers and those who are involved in a program as well as those who periodically receive blessing, receive a witness of your word. So continue, oh God, we pray, to advance and may you evermore be praised as a result of the work 
of UGM. We pray, Lord, for various other needs that are upon our thoughts and our hearts, some which we have shared with many others and some which we have kept, Lord, in our secret prayer time before you. Hear us and grant our requests, we pray. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we pray for workers for the gospel harvest. We pray for those in authority and we pray for those with utterly no authority at all. We pray, Lord, for your word to be sent forth with power this day. May it be unexplainable in any other way except your Holy Spirit so mightily at work. We pray for your coming that it would not be long. We pray for our own hearts to be tender before you. We pray, O oh God, that as your word is opened, that truly your word would be open before our eyes and that our ears would be at be attentive to the declaration and the proclamation of your holy word. May lives be radically, radically transformed by the word which we hear today. Bless Pastor Jordan as he ministers of your word. And so may each of us be richly built up in you. These mercies and these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We uh, read the first portion of Psalm chapter 37, verses 1 to 22, a little earlier in the service, and we're going to continue in Psalm 37, reading from verse 23 all the way to the end of the chapter. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so that you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are persevered forever, but the descendants will be, of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is on his heart. He step, his steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord, and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen wicked, violent men spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright. For the man of peace will have posterity, but the transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Having read through the entire chapter of Psalm 37, there are quite a few applications that you and I can implement to our lives. Although this psalm finds itself just 37 chapters into the book, it is actually one of the psalms that David wrote later and very much near the end of his life. And it is laden with the learned wisdom of one who has lived a full, a full and very uh, effective life. It stands in contrast to some of the other psalms that are written in a style that, in a style that might be more emotional or that where the reader 
hears how David worshipped or worked through trials or outcried to God in trouble. Instead, it is written more in a style of that that we might equate with the Proverbs. Uh, and this is because it pictures David as a man who has lived his years and is now passing down the life information that he finds most vital. He wants to inform the next generation underneath him of how to live well for the Lord and the key things that are part of living well for the Lord. Now, um, the question remains though, what are the, these key principles that David puts forward in the psalm? And how should these principles influence our daily walk with the Lord? Well, the first principle that we learn is that we must not fear or be envious of evildoers. For we read in the very beginning of Psalm 37, Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Now, this principle has two different components to it. Firstly, let's address fretting and fearing. When we as Christians look around and look at the world, we at times fear because so much around us seems to be unstable. Wars, viruses, stock market crashes, riots, murders, and all types of evil are plastered in front of us by various mediums such as TV, internet, newspaper, and radio. The entire world seems to be overrun by evil as governments across the world throw more, more and more hateful laws up against Christianity. We fear for our religious freedom and we fear for the type of world that our children may have to grow up in. Now, a certain amount of fear is a healthy thing for it protects us from taking unnecessary risks and it keeps our mind alert and active. However, there is a point where fear starts to become overwhelming and it affects our hearts and minds and the spiritual relationship we have with God. David himself was no stranger to fear for he was at many times running for his life and he had to trust in God wholly while he was doing that running. But the question remains, why do we fear though? I think a large portion of it has to do with what we consume and what thoughts we allow to become preeminent in our minds, especially, uh, and especially a major influencer of our thoughts and minds today is the media that we take in on a daily basis. We as Christians ought to be very cautious of the messages that we are allowing into our hearts and minds. Never in the history of man has there been the ability for media and, and radio and TV to work its way into our homes where they can, they can influence our thoughts, our hearts and our minds. And never has there been a point where there has been this ability to build a sense of anxiety and fear in, uh, and trepidation of the world in the hearts of believers. Now, I think I'm just as much at fault as anybody for listening to these fearful voices too much. I personally am a person that likes to keep really up to date with what is going on in the world. But, as I've searched myself and as I've consumed more media and TV shows and talk media about what's going on in the world, I've slowly found myself more fearful of the future, angry at the world, and more riled up about things that, frankly, I can't control whatsoever. They're out of my hands. Being informed of what's happening in the halls of parliament or, uh, or what's happening on a daily basis in our society is one thing, but when these perspectives dominate our thoughts and all we can think about is how the world is going wrong, we let the world's fear start to take captive our lives. 
This is because fear in its very nature is a perpetual downward cycle that continually feeds upon itself. Now, this can be expressed in an example of a child's fear of the dark. Now, it's not normally the dark itself that makes children afraid, but rather it is the uh, imagination of that child that causes them to be afraid. Take, for example, little Bill. He's being tucked into bed at night and his parents, uh, his parents close the door and turn off the light and Bill's imagination starts turning. Now, he's thinking about all the possibilities of monsters just hiding out of view. Now, these monsters may all be imaginary, but to Bill, they are very real. The creaking of the house cooling down sounds like a footstep. The wind whistling a monster's breath. Soon Bill is running to his parents' bedroom so that they can protect him from the terror he has unleashed upon himself. Now, in some senses, we as adults don't get out of that mentality that children have with fear. Now, it is true that in this world, there are many terrors plenty of monsters as well. But in the scope of eternity, these happenings in the world which get covered by the news continually are, mere, are merely the imaginary monsters that plagued Bill's mind. Sure, they do indeed have an actual effect on us in the here and now, but in the scope of all eternity, these fears that the world tries to instill in us are not even to be considered of or worthy of any value. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be brash and uncaring about the value of life or, or, uh, or that it's wrong to so show sympathy for those who are genuinely in a panicked state about the world. But rather, it is vital that we as Christians view things from an eternal perspective. This is why the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 7, it says that we would hold the peace of God which surpasses all understanding or comprehension. The same things that make the world crouch and, and, and cower in fear, we can laugh at because even death itself has been swallowed up in victory by Christ and his works. The problem is that all too often we allow the news of evil and evildoers to cloud the daily Christian joy that we should hold and possess. This is why David repeats this call to stay away from fear and anger. For he says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. This brings me to my second point. Fear and anger often come hand in hand. And anger can draw us into ourselves and into fighting our own battles. Often when we fear, we become more concerned about the world's issues that we see around us than the concern that we have for the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be fully transparent in this. I, at times, have been guilty of this myself. I am young. I'm passionate. And at times, the, uh, and at times the emotions can stir me and I can feel very stirred about what is happening in this world. For how can one not be angry about some of the bills that get passed in Parliament that are blatantly against what, by, what, what God's word teaches? Now, I'm not saying that it is a sin to be angry. There is a certain place for righteous justice and righteous anger. However, the central issue here is that not that we might get angry with what is happening in the world, but rather it is not wise to partake in a steady diet of media that uh, stirs up this fear and this anger and this emotion within us until we are so bothered by everything that it deprives us of our God-given joy. We must come to terms with the fact 
that we really cannot do anything of our own accord which will turn this world around. For it is only by transformed hearts and minds and by the power of God that anything can be made of this terrible world. You may ask then, how do we counter the world's fear? Well, a good place to start is by turning off the world's message highway. Try to turn off the TV and put down the newspaper, not watching the latest show on YouTube which focuses on the newest world tragedy out. There's a new one every 24 hours, it seems. The Word of God tells us really all we need to know about the depravity of the human heart. And anything that we see on the screen is just more evidence proving that the Bible is indeed true. So instead, if you feel anxious about the world around you or fearful about what is happening in the world, take up the Bible and read about the eternal promises that God has given you. Read on the hope that we have in the kingdom of God and God's ultimate victory over evil. Allow the peace which surpasses all understanding to, to uh, permeate your mind and dwell in your soul for we know that our God is faithful and no matter what happens here on this earth that in the end the Lord's plans will come to full fruition. In, in fact, in Isaiah 41.10, God states to the Israelites, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is exactly what David meant when he said in Psalm 37.25, when he said, I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. So do not fear, for you have the sovereign Lord on your side. This uh, leads me to the third point that I want to take from this passage. And that is that the same eternal thinking that David mentions is so important is also important for applying to our lives as a whole. Throughout Psalm 37, there are calls for the reader to stay away from the wicked and not do evil for personal gain. For the wicked and their, and their deeds and their accomplishments will fade away. In short, he re David repeats again and again that we must not be envious of wrongdoers. Now, what David says in this chapter uh, can also be expanded past simply wrongdoers, but it also encompasses the entire world because we know from reading the Bible that the entirety of humanity is fallen short of the glory of God. Let's start off with an illustration very similar to the one that David mentions in Psalm 37. Picture a particular individual sitting and eating. He has lived his life to the full. He has enjoyed and experienced all the luxuries of this world, from fine cars like Ferraris to nice boats and fantasy watches and Rolexes. He's eaten the best meals and all the food that one could imagine. He currently sits down happily with a spread of lobster, steak, and caviar. All the while, the righteous person is sitting outside the house with a bowl of oatmeal. Now, the righteous man with a bowl of oatmeal may feel jealous of this man with plenty. The righteous one may ask God, why is this fair? And why does the one who does not love the Lord obtain all things enviable in this world, while the righteous one who lives rightly follows the law and gives of himself is poor. At this question, God reveals to the righteous man that the unrighteous man who has been, who has been seen for having so much is in reality consuming his last requested meal before being sentenced to death. He is merely minutes 
away from an execution chamber. And the Lord turns to the righteous man and he asks the righteous man, is the position of the worldly man now so enviable? I think this scene is often how we as Christians can get deceived into seeing the world. We can be easily captivated by the various joys and be tempted to envy those who put trust in material things. However, the Bible provides us the the full picture of what is really happening. All the things in this world and all the things that people may possess, all its luxuries are but merely a final meal before capital judgment for those that only put their trust in the world. For those who only trust in the world, this world is the absolutely best thing that they will ever experience. In the short 80 or so years that they live, this is all that they will ever get. And then, poof, it'll be gone. It'll disappear. That will be that. And now, I know this world does provide some pretty great experiences. And there are some pretty neat things to own and eat and go to. But in all reality, they are nothing compared to the possible possibility of eternal life. The short time we spend on this world is absolutely nothing compared to eternity. Now, I am not saying that we can't enjoy life. Please, do not get me wrong on this. God made many beautiful and wonderful things for us to enjoy. He gave us minds for invention so that we can feel the hair of our of our heads swirl as the wind blows through it as we drive down the highway in a convertible. Now, I don't have a convertible, but I think it would be a pretty nice feeling. <laughs> so, but, so this in itself is not bad. In fact, it is very Good, but when our desire for worldly things such as this turn to envy and we wish for more than what God has granted us and we take hold of the world more closely than we take hold of God and his word, we're not viewing the world through the eternal perspective that God desires us to view it through. So then practically, what is to be done? How do we apply this principle to our lives. Well, when we see the world, we must not envy the things of this world or try to follow in the ways of the wicked so that we may obtain or gain material success. We know from God's word that all will fade away and that the only thing that will remain is our faith in the Lord and those treasures which we have stored up in heaven by serving him daily. It is not wrong to want something or to, desi- or to desire something, but that desire does become wrong if it becomes greater than our desire for God. And in that, and if that desire grows, then we become just like the rest of the world. David's warning against this illicit envy or lust for the possessions of this world or the possessions of wrongdoers rings true just as much today as it did 3,000 years ago. Now, this leads us to the fourth primary point in the passage, and that is on the temporariness of life. It is true that the former two warnings, don't fear and don't envy, are very common throughout this chapter. But perhaps even more prevalent is the statement of judgment that God will enact upon those who follow the path of this world. Six times David mentions the downfall of the wicked. He says, they will wither quickly like the grass, and they will fade away like the green herb, that they will be cut off, or that their sword shall enter their own heart, or that the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Much of this language that David uses in the Psalms is to exemplify the judgment of the wicked and it communicates the temporal nature of our state. It is not forever. It is passing. The feeling of the temporary is then, conf- is then compared to the life which God offers for the righteous. 
This is what I want to stress on for the rest of this message. David was an old man by the time he wrote the psalm. And by that time, he started to realize the true value of things in this life. Throughout the psalm, the reader, or, or David encourages the reader to depart from evil and do good so that you will abide forever. But the verse that Brest expresses how this is accomplished is given in verses 3 to 4, which says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this perhaps is one of the mis most misused verses in the Bible. All too often, this verse is used to tell the Christian that if they just trust God enough, that God will give them whatever they want in this world. And it saddens my heart greatly that this verse is so often twisted in that manner. For if that were true, then this verse would directly contradict David's other statements in the chapter about not envying the wrongdoers or taking stock in this fading, finite world. The question really is then, is God an infinite means to a finite end? Or is he an infinite means to an infinite end? Those who would take this verse and use it to decry that God will give us health, wealth, and prosperity are missing out on the most important aspect of how God's transformative power works in the heart of man. You see, when man tr fully trusts in the Lord and does good and follows his law, the Lord starts a work in the heart and in the mind of the believer, taking it from a mind that is focused on the flesh and then transforming it into one that is focused on the heavenly or eternal things. The more a Christian trusts in God, and follows him, the more they start to delight in the presence of God. Every hour of the day starts to become ever brighter as we come to the realization that the God of the universe stepped down from heaven to reveal himself to us and enter into a relationship with his creation. We become overwhelmed by his great love for us as our hearts are transformed. And as our hearts are transformed, so too are our desires. Now, our desires will not be as they once were, focused on the fear of living in this world or in envy of worldly things, but rather we will desire to be in an ever-growing and ever deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior. This new desire, which comes out of loving God, is the one that will always, always be fulfilled. For the one that puts their trust in God will have the reward in him. And that reward is eternally dwelling in his presence, the one whom they love. God is the greatest fulfillment of our desires because he is the greatest good possible. He is the greatest fulfillment that we can ever possibly have in this life. No other thing in this world can even compare to it. Well, that then remains and gives us the question, how, though, do we obtain this desire for God? How do we transform our hearts in our minds? How do we work to achieve this? And this too is good news. For in Psalm 37, if we read verses 39 and 40, David's, D David writes, <clears throat> But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. In conclusion, this eternal outlook, the desire for God, the shunning of the fear and the anger of this world, and the reward for knowing God is held out for us 
as a gift of grace. God offers his salvation to the righteous, to each of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Even David in the Old Testament knew that it was only by God's strength and mercy that he could find ultimate peace. He, the mighty warrior, could not fight himself to freedom. He couldn't stand on his own and, and achieve the peace of this life. But the salvation of the righteous was from the Lord and the Lord alone. In the same manner, Christ has saved us from the death row of this world. And he has delivered us from evil. God calls us to a relationship with him freely so that we may find our desire in him and come to know him more and more each day until the fullness of eternity. This is what it means to truly have hope in this life, to find true peace and to rest and be, and be peaceful amongst a troubled and angry and fearful world, a fearful world that we live in every day. This is where we as Christians can rest, and it is so good to rest in God and in God alone, for the reward is eternity. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives as we walk through this life. Help us to take to heart David's advice that we would not become afraid of this world or angry at what is happening around us, but rather that we may place our hope and trust fully in you. God, we ask that we would not try to obtain this peace out of our own strength, but we would, that we would allow you to lift us up in your great salvation as we humbly submit ourselves to you, that you, by the power of your spirit, would work in our hearts and minds so that we would see your fullness and, and pursue you with everything that we have. May our desire only be for you, and may we experience your fullness and goodness each day more and more until eternity. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our uh, final hymn for today is To God Be the Glory. And would you please rise to sing verses 1 and 3. <laughs>
benediction today comes from Corinth or Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen.